This is a continuation in my conversation about the two debates that were held for the Democratic presidential primary 2020 election. And I had just ended in my last video talking about the concept of ageism and Eric Swalwell, representative of California, and how it appeared to be his mantra to keep saying, pass the torch, uh, uh, referencing essentially the older politicians versus the younger politicians. And I found that to be hauntingly uh, disrespectful and ageist and pandering to young people or those who would sympathize. And that brings me immediately then to the candidates who most concern me and then I'm going to talk about those who most impress me and I'm going to give you my reasons why. So I do start with Eric Swalwell. If I had to pick one candidate out of all of the candidates, in fact, running for office, I would say the single most disconcerting candidate for me is Eric Swalwell. Now, I don't mean any disrespect to Representative Swalwell. He impresses me. I believe he um, started out in Congress at 31, older, younger than I am today at 33. He's extraordinarily ambitious for a young man his age, and I totally respect that. I would shake his hand. I'd love to chat with him, ask him questions and such, and I don't mean to suggest that I think he's like a, a bad person, or I don't mean in any way, shape, or form to offer bad sentiments his way. However, he did strike me as perhaps, with respect to his rhetoric and his approach, to have, at this point in time, the worst out of the candidates running for office and you know maybe his age speaks to that ironically a bit for all of his pass the torch pass the torch uh, it's the younger people who are going to save the world not the older people talk it would seem that perhaps his youthfulness is um apparent in his bias and his inability to push aside ageist ideas and think more objectively uh, and inclusively. That being said, I was guilty of being an ageist to the opposite, uh, in the opposite way, in that for the last several weeks I've been speaking out against Pete Buttigieg uh, out of concern for the fact that he's still only in his 30s. Uh, it had concerned me that. Uh, Anyone who is that young and also that inexperienced. Again, no disrespect to Pete Buttigieg. I know he was mayor and I know he's very smart, but I've been concerned in the past uh, about his uh, only being mayor and not having other uh, kinds of political and official office experience. That being said, it would be, I guess, ageist of me and uh, biased of me not to pay him perhaps a bit more consideration. So I want to thank actually Bernie Sanders for really being the one to open my mind with respect to, I think, being a little bit more appreciative of the fact that you might be young and so-called uh, lacking in experience but actually perhaps have unique qualifications. And I'd still need to learn more about Pete Buttigieg, but that being said, I will not discount him anymore, merely on account of his age. Though his relative inexperience does still concern me somewhat. In any event, yeah, this whole thing with Eric Swalwell totally disqualifies him, in my opinion. He was the single most concerning, disconcerting candidate, not just of the night, but in fact, I think, out of all the two, two debates combined. Next, actually, I was rather troubled by uh, former Vice President Joe Biden. I don't know what the context would be with respect to how and why he ultimately thinks as he does and behaves as he does. I have remarked that at times he appears 
I, I made the off-the-cuff remark about his possible senility that was maybe not appropriate for me to say now that I think about it, but um, that doesn't change the fact, and I apologize about that. That was just a stupid thing for me to say, I think. Uh, but the, it does seem at times that he's not entirely with it, though that might be more of an intellectual, political um, gamble that he thinks he's making by trying to play to the moderates and thinking that he's going to win the election, the primary election. I think he has not learned anything about the 2016 election, which spoke to the fact, not just that there is a real burst of populism in the United States and that therefore people outside of the elite coastal academic demographics are frustrated and seeking policies that speak more to them and politicians who can speak more directly to them as opposed to at them per se uh, may, there is that concern of course but it seems as if Biden is just also not really I think intellectually processing some important policy issues I mean I wrote about this in the past if we talk about the Hyde Amendment pertaining to abortion and how it is made quite clear, at least on the surface, that Biden only changed his position on this policy. By the way, for those of you who don't, who are not familiar with the Hyde Amendment, it's the law that says that Medicare funds or Medicaid funds rather cannot be used to fund abortions, which unfairly uh, excludes oppressed minority groups and um, the economically suffering as well. And so only, you know, rich, lucky people are able to get abortions if, if they need them or want them for that matter. And Biden was insensitive towards that and had supported that, that situation and that setup only until like everyone in the democratic field including the mainstream media expressed concern only then did he suddenly change his position so on the one hand you might appreciate that joe biden is willing to change his mind when people put the pressure on to me it came across more like you no know, biden is willing to do what he thinks will advance him whatever it is that's how he comes across but he also comes across as, again, just not with it. Where he concerned me the most was on um, health care because his point was really to just keep Obamacare and improve Obamacare. I think he doesn't understand that Obamacare is not the solution and that we do need a serious, fundamental, continued overhaul of how health insurance and health care is done in this country and a mere couple of amendments to Obamacare is not going to solve that problem. We need to be moving towards universal health care. We need to be in a place where everybody can get top quality health care regardless of where they were born or who they were born to or what their economic situation is because otherwise it would just be cruel and it would just be callous disregard for human life and so he's just not on point in my opinion ethically with the social need for improved healthcare quality he just didn't speak to it eloquently or in a way that showed an intense awareness of that to me uh, the other issue I think where we need to talk about Joe Biden is in foreign policy now it was brought up that he had voted for the war in Iraq and he got really defensive about that and instead of really taking responsibility for it he said well you know when I was vice president I was uh, so great in being part of the withdrawal of Iraq getting out of Iraq which by the way not only is that are you showing that you're not willing to really take responsibility for what a mistake that was but the way that obama and biden and the administration withdrew from iraq was not a success it was a failure because all it did was create a haven for isis which cost us a lot of resources and time and lives 
and brought further disruption to the Middle East, which is already complex enough. So that was just the wrong thing to say. But then Biden went on to say that essentially we need to withdraw from Afghanistan now. And it's true, we do need to have a conversation about how to improve the situation in Afghanistan and ultimately get out. But you don't, like I said last night, uh, in discussing the policies of Tulsi Gabbard, from representative from Hawaii, you don't just snap your fingers and withdraw from Afghanistan. We've got to be very engaged uh, as, for example, uh, representative of Ohio, Tim Ryan said, we've got to be mindful of what victory in Afghanistan might actually look like and really put together a strategy as opposed to the sort of mindless approach that Trump has. And then once we know what a success would look like, talk about what it would mean to withdraw and how upon withdrawing, we ensure that there's not going to be another group like the Taliban that comes in and creates haven for Al Qaeda, or that we don't have ISIS or another or you know group do that, cause that uh, cause danger to our country or to our allies, or cause general problems for our you know for the folks in the Middle East in general. So I think Biden was just off there. I mean Kamala Harris also really made some good points about how. Biden could have been much more staunch in his advocacy for the federal government to make a strong stand back in the 70s on local schools, uh, instating integration and busing students in the poor black uh, inner cities to more suburban, white, wealthier uh, areas so that there would be integration in our schools and not the segregation that we used to see. And again, I think Biden was just extraordinarily defensive towards that. And don't get me wrong, I appreciate that Biden wants to stand up for the good things that he's done on civil rights. And I don't mean to overlook his service to this country, but the man is seriously defensive and seriously not willing to take responsibility for his mistakes and just seriously just not showing a with itness for lack of better terms and he was just really to me does not have the mental um adroitness or adeptness in my opinion to be the president not if you compare him to everyone else running so he was also the most concerning person i also talked about how i was really disturbed by msnbc in general i want to reiterate that because I don't think the debate was fair. I mean, I think it's interesting because they actually gave more time to Joe Biden than they did to any other candidate. I think The Hill said that the speaking time he got in the debate clocked into at about 12 minutes compared to Andrew Yang, who only got about two minutes and 50 seconds of speaking time, The Hill says. I mean, there was an obvious unfairness there. <laughs> and I mean, for a news organization that's actually my favorite at present, uh, for a news organization that believes in things like inclusiveness and fairness and equality and such things, there was considerable inequality at that debate and unfairness. And I think it's really unacceptable. And I mentioned that in the other video, so I'm not going to go on about it now. But I do want to say that hopefully as debates go on in the future, uh, there will be enough criticism about how MSNBC put theirs together that there will be improvements. And I mean, I was really disappointed, especially considering, actually, Rachel Maddow is one of my favorite political commentators, like, ever. And I don't know, like, I'm not going to hold her responsible chiefly for how the debate ultimately went down. I know she played a part in it, though, and I was disappointed that there was not more assertiveness in equalizing the time that each candidate was given, because that's what makes for a truly fair and balanced debate. And fair and balanced that debate was not. So shame on MSNBC, in my opinion, because it was just so blatantly unfair. That said, we can move on to the candidates that I found most impressive. And actually, Andrew Yang impressed me. I think, hey, there are a lot of policies that you can could consider most important. He was really passionate. The few uh, 
seconds of time he actually got to speak, he spent mostly talking about a universal uh, basic income. And I did speak to you in the other video about how that's actually a policy that I am now for. And I, in fact, think that it ought to be a priority. I think we need to invest in people. And I think if we're gonna have a conversation about investing in green energy, if we're gonna throw all of this money at Lockheed Martin, or the lucky people who happen to be the ones that the government wants to give money to, that just to me seems unfair. And I get the fact that at the end of the day, the whole concept of government investment um, and tax credits and things might be to counteract the fact that some people are doing better economically than others and that the government wants to intervene by doing what it can to help create a stimulus where there should be a stimulus but one's not being created either in a particular industry or among certain demographics and I get that, but I believe we have reached such a point where there is so much crony capitalism and there's so much pandering because politics consists so much of um, dolling out so many resources for the lucky few. To me, at this point, if we're going to do that, we might as well make sure everyone is getting some money. Why should, why should weapon people in weapons production and sales and manufacturing get so much money? Why should Big Pharma get so much money from Medicaid and Medicare? Why should some people get so much money from the taxpayers? But so many other people get nothing, and yet they're paying taxes. That is utterly unfair. And if you truly believe in rational investment, in my opinion, there's nothing more lucrative than investing in a human being and helping that human being do something with their money, which is why this is something I forgot to mention in how, in fact, the debate had stimulated my thinking. Another policy, there needs to be more education in our high school level, even perhaps in middle school level and in college level about financial management and helping people as consumers. What does it mean to buy insurance? What are the different insurance companies that are out there? What are the different services they offer? Why should you pick this service versus that? What does it mean to be a responsible consumer? And I'm not saying we should preach to any, we should not preach or endorse a particular company or kind of service, but have you ever been on the phone with like an insurance coverage uh, company and they ask you all these questions and you're like, bleep, yo, I don't know. I don't know the answer to which of those options I want. I got to really spend some time and go contemplate that. But you're putting me under pressure to answer that question now. And how many people are prepared to even think critically about um, questions that consumers face? And also, I think that there needs to be philosophy, more philosophy in education as well, because that's what's going to really push people to a place where they contemplate, what is the value of a human being? Are human beings worth more than money? And why are they more important than money? Why do we know that? Why should we think that? You can hear it on TV, you can read about it in literature, but to really delve into the abstract principles and ideas that lead to our thoughts on these topics, people should be exposed to these questions, especially of epistemology and ethics. And I guess it was something about um, Yang and universal, uh, basic universal income that led me to that thought. But, but my whole point is, if we actually educate people really well and give them a little bit of money, I can't imagine a better thing you could do for this economy. And I'm not talking about like overwhelmingly flooding people with tax funded to, with tax dollars so that they can go live in Shangri-La. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you give somebody a little jolt of resources so that they can make even more of their lives that's the best thing you could do not just for that person and for their loved ones but also for society for the culture for the for the world for humanity for global universal culture 
we should invest in each other, we should love each other, we should want one another to thrive. And I can't think of a better way to do that than to invest in one another through this universal basic income. And by the way, it will somewhat equalize things. And I mean, you're not going to make some people, you're not gonna make people rich by doing this. And you're not gonna solve poverty by doing it, but you know what? You're gonna give people the opportunity to try to invest in themselves and make their lives better economically and spiritually. You're going to give them the opportunity. It's, it's not a guarantee that people will spend the money properly. But I mean, we do, by the way, there are actually libertarians out there who think, you know what, forget all these welfare ideas. Let's just give everyone a little bit of money per month. And you know, it's on them if they don't do anything with it. Now, I don't know if I would go that far, but I do know it's interesting that across the ideological spectrum, there are people who appreciate the fact that by actually investing in human beings, they can do a lot with it. They really could. I guess I will do a quick self plugging here. If you want to invest in my video blog, I could probably do a lot with it and make this um, better because that would give me the opportunity to um, spend more time actually doing the analysis the analyses that I do and enable me to buy more books and do things that help me blog better I, I guess I'd have to do a list of things that I would ultimately want money for but um just saying while we're talking about investing in people if you want to invest in public the public comment blog I'm your guy anyway um, that aside. So yeah, Yang, I mean, it's not fair. They just didn't give him enough time. So for those of you who are willing to acknowledge that MSNBC did a bad job in that respect, since he got so little time, I want to take the time to say, check out yang2020.com. And whether you ultimately dismiss the guy or not, I hope that you will at least give him a fair hearing and compare him and contrast him to the other folks in these debates. And I do think, again, the idea of a basic universal income is a genius policy idea and is a must do as soon as possible. It's not even a complicated thing. The other thing that's complicated is what would be a fiscally responsible way of doing it. And by the way, we could like cut our spending on defense and still spend more money than any other country on earth and probably afford some form of guaranteed income. Um, the next candidate that really impressed me was Gillibrand, Senator of New York. I, I thought that she was exceptionally eloquent and particul particularly in terms of like characterizing, I think philosophically the nature of how we need to improve the way things are in this country. She said, the problem is not greed. I mean, she said the, the problem is greed. She said, the problem is not capitalism as such, but greed. And I think that is so important because this is what really distinguishes her, let's say, from Bernie Sanders, who is a nominal socialist who won't explain why really he calls himself a socialist and won't really delve into the definition of the word. Gillibrand, therefore, is just more intellectually responsible than Sanders is, and she was more ideologically and philosophically assertive and sharp than probably any other candidate. She is pretty much my top choice for president at this point. Uh, as I look at all the candidates, yeah, I, I pick uh, Gillibrand over all the other ones. Gillibrand's my candidate, top candidate at this point in time. That could change, but she's the one. Again, she just understands the problem. The problem is not capitalism. The problem is greed. And I think the point is to understand capitalism quite like democracy. Because in democracy, the whole point is you give everyone a chance to vote. And have contribute to the political fate of the 
greater society. And I think economically, it's important to do the same thing. I think that everyone should get a vote through their dollar to say this is a product or a service or an offering sort of you know sort of market offering that I appreciate over the other version of that or the other you know the competition of that and I think that kind of competition is actually healthy because it enables us to say this is what I liked about that but they could be improved by doing this I'm gonna go make the improved version and p competition therefore to me is not about like really even overpowering the other person but it, it's, it's like um, offering a perspective through the manifestation of your product or service that the other person couldn't because we're all different we're all going to have different perspectives and see different things I can't imagine a better way than to have a basically capitalistic approach to that. But just like democracy is not perfect and therefore you have to have cer certain safeguards that makes democracy more work better and that is more is more fair, so sh I believe that should be the case for capitalism. And I believe that Gillibrand really really understands that really well. And so she was really passionate about the idea of do, of, do, of um, establishing publicly funded elections. And she's right on about that. And she didn't just say that once. She really understands the how important that is and that absolutely ought to be a policy priority. And what I really liked about that too, she, she said it would be really valuable to have, say, the um the high school students who stood up in the march for our lives protests you know the parkland students and speaking out against gun violence and how they had to compete with all the resources that the nra had and if you took money out of the equation in politics they would have an amplified voice and a more facilitated ability to fight against the nra by the way, one more reason why Biden isn't worth it, because he said blame the gun manufacturers and not the NRA for where we are with respect to our standstill in advancing um, gun control policy. To Vice President Biden, respectfully, are you not aware of all the lobbying that the NRA does to stifle the advancement of gun control policy? Gun people make the guns, and they have a right to make guns. We have a right to gun ownership, we have a right to self-defense, and there are ways to have a more developed, nuanced discussion on that. But the way he was so defensive of the NRA just made him look like he was very well sponsored by them, and it was just very disconcerting. Gillibrand clearly distinguished herself from him in that regard, and really stood out. She also is really clear about uh, being troubled by uh, privately funded prisons and how when your number one goal is profit, you're not always going to have the, um, what you have an interest, if you're making a profit off of prisons, then you have an interest in seeing people break the law and go to jail so that you make more money. So when people are in a position, and by the way, speaking ideologically, check out Andrew Yang's website, yang2020.com, because he talks about a sort of humanistic kind of capitalism where people are put over profits. He is really eloquent about this, but Gillibrand talks about this too. Greed should not be the motivating factor. And when you give people incentive to favor greed over people, such as the case with privately funded prisons, we're gonna have a problem with that. Finally, Gillibrand talks about how universal healthcare is a good goal, but that to do it, it might be worth having people buy in at, I think she said like 2% of their income into a public option and force the public option to compete with the private and she said either hopefully that would change the private insurance or um, lead to a popularization of 
public health insurance. I think that's not an awful idea. I think it may not be so easy to snap our fingers and know exactly how we're going to make any kind of you know ultimate Medicaid for all concept work, but I think she was really constructive in how to do it. I think Bernie Sanders was not so much actually really good at talking about the how-tos with respect to a lot of his policies. Finally, uh, the other candidate who really impressed me was Pete Buttigieg. And that was the surprise of the night for me because prior to that, I was biased against Buttigieg because I had I had an ageist bias, actually. I didn't like him because I considered him both too young and inexperienced and therefore cocky. But in fact, it, in actually listening to him talk about the variety of issues and seeing how he contrasts with all of the candidates, he was right on about health care and talking about how, again, like Gillibrand, you can't snap your fingers and just get to universal, but that it is important to ensure that everyone is covered. He was very bold in calling out the hypocrisy of so-called Christians who make bigotry and things part of their ideology, which he explains has nothing to do with Christianity. I'm not a Christian, so I didn't feel that he was speaking for me or against me. However, I think it's pretty damn bold to speak so forcefully and directly about religion in a culture where there's still, I think, a lot of um, bias towards perhaps Christian ideas, I wonder. And um, so I think that was very brave, and he has my respect for that. He also spoke to this idea that it's important for people to live well, even if they didn't go to college, and not because there's something wrong with them for not going to college, but that it's really just not for everyone. He's really realistic about that and demonstrated a real interest in their well-being. Finally, Buttigieg talked about the importance of investing in rural America. It is a concern, and I think this goes into a conversation about the Electoral College, a conversation ultimately that we didn't have in either of the last two debates that I think there should be, but one of them is the question of how does rural America get influenced by, let's say, replacing, getting rid of the Electoral College, replacing it with a popular election, would they be less represented? It is a fact that rural America witnesses drastic poverty, a lot of people on food stamps and government subsidized programs in rural America. Rural America doesn't necessarily get the highest quality internet. There are a lot of things that they don't necessarily get the highest quality education either. So we do need to invest in rural America. And I think he spoke to that. Um, and specifically, for example, how perhaps creating jobs through investment in green industries in rural America might be one way we could do that. And I think, that, again, there's a conversation to be had about what makes for fair government investment in this or that. I said my first priority with respect to that would be a universal basic income. But again, that's a more detailed topic to get more thorough about later. I like that he's talking about awareness of the fact that rural America is actually an underrepresented uh, group in some respects with respect to the poverty they suffer and how they're being hurt, for example, by the trade wars that President Trump has initiated. Now, I wanted to make a final comment about, the, a closing remark about Bernie Sanders because I find him to be, um, he's not a top choice for me. I don't hate him though. Uh, there are things I don't like about him. I, I just think a few comments should be said about him, particularly because I think he actually has a very good shot of winning, even if he's not my candidate of choice. And there are a few things he actually does really well that I think are worth saying and worth other people thinking about. He, first of all, is totally right about the mentality that there needs to be a revolutionary way of thinking right now, and that we are at a revolutionary time in American history. I told you already that I've got a blog about that and that this is a, a motif of mine. It's why I'm video blogging, because I think it's the a new medium for the future as an art form. And so I think that Bernie Sanders understands that we can talk about all the different things we want to do to make America better for more people, 
but you've got to have the courage, he said, to really speak out against big pharma and to really speak out against the highly moneyed corporations who are stifling um, a fairer distribution of wealth in this country. He's right about that. Uh, he's also, I mean, like him or dislike him, what he says, he is very evocative in his rhetoric. And I think he says things in very, um, he gets you going, I think. When I listen to him speak, for example, about Donald Trump, and he just flat out called Trump a racist, and he flat out called Trump a pathological liar, I mean, these things are true. And I think it's refreshing to have someone who doesn't just sort of dance around talking about how bad Trump is or just sort of say it in a, um, yeah, Trump is bad, but I think he says it in a sort of actually very objectively important way. I think he was just more eloquent than others about that. Of course, that's just rhetoric. Rhetoric is not policy. And one of my concerns with Bernie Sanders is he has certain rhetorical strengths. Um, even if he doesn't substantiate them very well, which the number one problem with him, again, this being a piece of that is, he likes to call himself a socialist, but he never really defines socialism or deals with how do socialism is actually defined. And when people ask him about it, when a lot of questions people ask him, he just doesn't answer. Even, for example, how he would ultimately make his um, Medicaid for all work, Medicare for all. So. I mean, he's neither the most impressive or the least, he's never, he's neither the most concerning or most impressive candidates for me. Now, there are other candidates I just didn't mention. To me, they were just, they were neither horrifying nor were they like extraordinarily impressive. So maybe another time in another context, uh, I just wanted to talk about, to me, the things that were most noteworthy from a voter's perspective. I hope that this has been helpful to you in some way, shape, or form. I'm not saying you have to agree with me, but I hope that you were able to at least get a um, pretty comprehensive analysis of these debates as they went on. Thank you so much, and I will talk to you again soon. Have a great day. Bye.